m- maybe maybe today oh your headphones are oh, you just through maybe today's s- segment could be about you know the the difficulties of the creative space like the negatives like w- what to expect what what negatives to expect in the the in the creative field yeah i mean that's so a good all of us yeah. all of us have been doing this for like a couple of years and there's a lot of like great things i think we'll you know maybe we can get into some of the benefits of being a creative that can be episode two which we'll do right after this yeah. but th- there's a whole lot of cre- you know th- there's a whole lot of benefits of there are a whole lot of benefits that come with being in the creative sphere working a, a job in in a creative business but a lot of people forget all of the negatives that come with it so the, the positives is you can kind of choose your own hours if you're freelancing uh, you, it's really fun and fulfilling because you're doing your own thing but the negatives there are quite a bit so for me it's probably like the the pressure of dealing with clients who are treating you really badly and you end up going home miserable and it's not a nine to five thing at least sometimes it's not at the beginning it's not and you take that home because you work from home and wherever you go so the pressure is there non-stop you go to sleep with it whereas when you have a nine to five job it's just like done anyway so uh the 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 first one was that you had underlined yeah so creativity under pressure okay cool maybe let's start there so we've all been under pressure we've all had um and we don't need to do an intro anything we just keep rolling keep it conversational but we've all had situations where we're like under massive pressure and we're trying to finish something for whatever reason because uh, you know our boss told us to or uh, the clients like really needing to get something done or whatever the case is maybe we can relate a story about um you know having had to be creative because you have to be creative that's what they expect from you but you have to do it between now and thursday at 8 a.m um so does it work maybe that's the question does does creativity work when you're under pressure yes or no and why so i don't know if you want to kick us off yeah i think i think it's important when you're trying to be creative to have some sort of of parameters to work within okay so if you're under pressure 100 percent, it it does help but if you're under too much pressure then it's damaging but if you have too much open time open-endedness then there's unlimited potential for creativity and you kind of never get anywhere yeah so you need enough pressure to be creative but there are definitely situations we've been in what's the line for you yeah like i don't know it also depends on the project like i've had times where i've had to execute a video that i should have taken maybe six hours on in less than an hour Mm. and when trying to cut something down so much you obviously have to be incredibly creative Mm. with the way that you solve things but the the final product is nothing compared to what i could have done in six hours but it did force me to sort of be more creative so i think if i'm trying to put out work that i'm proud of it it has to be a reasonable amount of time with a little bit of pressure like a due date but something that's more than reasonable to be sufficiently creative Mm -hmm. Um, but those like super confined like tight pressure situations where you have to just knock something out super super quickly i think they're important to help you with creative decision making in a sense where what i learned from doing that project in one hour will help me with future projects but it didn't necessarily make me more creative in that particular instance what's what's too much pressure like at at what point is it just like at what point do you hyperventilate and you have a panic attack i think i don't know it it takes quite a lot or has has that ever happened to you it happens often (laughs) it does um but i mean uh, it's never been at a point where I've freaked out longer than maybe 30 minutes and then pull myself back together and, and C- carry on working. Can you relate like a, what does it feel like? I mean, the point of us speaking is to have the people at home who might want to pursue a career in the creative sphere have an idea of the realities that they might face. Can you give like an anonymous or vague example yeah, of, yeah. of how that's manifested so, itself? So basically I was I was working on a team with another person and they were in charge of handling this project as a whole. And after a couple of days of sort of pushing them for the final result, I got something in that was super, super subpar, like two days before the final due date. So this person was working on the project. You were pushing them to get it done. Yeah, because I was getting pressure from the client. So okay. 
I'm getting pressure from the clients. They're like, hey, where's this video done? They don't know that it's being done by someone else in the team because okay. I'm liaison with the, the person. So I'm pushing this person to get the, the project done. Eventually, I get a draft that I can send through and I, I look at it the day before it's due and it is like absolutely terrible. It's one of the worst things I've, I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. It literally looked like something I would have created on like PowerPoint when I was 13. So I had no choice but to send this through to the client at the time. Hey. So I sent it through with a bit of a disclaimer saying, listen, I know we didn't hit the mark. This is where we are. How can we save this? Because I knew there's no way they would have accepted it. Yeah. And basically they came back near like an hour before close of business, the day before this project was meant to go out, not just be due for revisions, but actually be distributed onto platforms. Yeah. And they were like, this is absolutely terrible. We can't do this. I don't know what we're going to do. It's a nightmare. Like that was their response. And I was like, okay, listen, this is obviously our fault. We need to rectify this. So I'm just going to sort it out, which resulted in me having to knock out this entire project that the other person was given two weeks to do. Uh -huh. I had to do it in one evening slash morning to deliver it by 9 a.m. the following morning. Mm. And it was like maybe four hours in that evening. So working from about 7 until 11 and then waking up at 6 a.m. the following day doing another four or five hours that morning, still delivering it like two hours after due dates. They pushed everything. Yeah. But that situation, first of all, was super stressful and terrible. I'm and getting terrible. stressed just hearing it. Yeah, but the, the result that came out of it was a video that was acceptable and the dopamine hit that I got from actu actually executing something that they accepted, receiving the messages from them saying, wow, come on, you, you're a miracle worker. I can't believe you pulled this out of nowhere. Um, that creative thinking that I had to apply to you know, execute that project was, was really... Mm an interesting experiment but it gives you confidence in your in your ability to yeah. i can do, i can do this exactly that when like you find yourself in a to. situation like that again which you don't want to but you will but yeah. this is life of course you find yourself in like a difficult situation you know okay i've got this i yeah. can do this it's also it's good to like know your limits like yeah. how far you can push yourself and at what point you break so that you can dial that back um, yeah, of course, you wouldn't want to try repeat this thing <coughs> five times Absolutely. in a row. You'll yeah. go be in an early grave in no time. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned before, that video is something that I'm definitely not proud of. I'm proud of... In the greater scheme of things. Yes, I'm proud of being able to get through that situation and deliver something that the client accepted and saved the day. But I would never put that piece of work in my portfolio yeah. because it was absolutely terrible. So what did you, let me throw a question at you. What did you do to the, so you were working on a team with another person. Yeah. They were, uh, I don't know, what's it called? They were Tough. reporting to you. What did you, or, or were you like on the same team or whatever? What did you, you know, did you let this person know like, hey man, you missed the mark or does one kind of just like move on? What does one do if someone else finds them in a situation like this? Yeah. What does one do? What, what's your take from it? How would you have communicated with a client in the future? Would you have sent off the subpar work? And do you let the person that you're working with on the team know, hey man, what you did was just not on? Yeah, I think it, it's kind of like a two-way street. So I definitely let the person know that they messed up, but in a constructive way. So mm. I basically said, listen, the client wasn't happy with the video. I had to redo it. This is what the new version looks like and what the client actually expected. Mm. And that opened up a conversation to figure out where that person went wrong and why they delivered such a terrible video. That way they know how to be better in the future. Exactly. Because the, their actual skill level and the reason we hired them in the first place was because they can do the job. It's mm. just in that particular situation, it was like a massive stuff up. Mm -hmm. And after having that conversation with the person, it was partially their fault for not putting in the effort that was required of them not being a, a self-starter and getting stuck in places and getting in touch with me and saying, hey, listen, this doesn't look great. Is How can I make this better? Yeah. And the second part, like the other side of it, was I could have been following up on that project's progress more often and saying, hey, how's it going? Hey, can you send me a clip of how it looks? Mm. And me realizing that there's an issue and he's not going to get it done a week before it was due and not just leaving him for two weeks and seeing his final draft the day before okay. and seeing how terrible So it you're is. learning, like you looked at yourself introspectively as well and said, okay, I, I could have done something yeah, better. Yeah, exactly. But that that's also like a, it opens up a whole nother conversation of should we as leaders be helping our employees more or because of the type of work we do, just get rid of people that can't like govern themselves properly and find people that will be able to do the job because we don't have time to mm. to coddle them. 
I think let's let's hear from Jeremy. Yeah, have I you had any, have you had a similar experience? Uh, I'd say the the problems that I've experienced in the past, it really falls down to establishing good, uh, I guess you could say, boundaries and managing expectations from clients. One thing that's often, I guess you could say, when uh, just a little backstory on me is I never went. I uh, spent much time in agency, especially when I was done learning my design thing like trade. I went straight into being a solopreneur okay. j- just because I'd heard a few too many stories of, you know, the, the age old situation of young creatives. They, you know, go to a big agency that looks promising and then year or two in there and they're just completely burnt out because yeah. they're grinding, you know, they're ground to dust by crazy expectations from the sales you know, created by the sales team so i didn't want any of that for myself so i think like just to expand on uh Kimon's, uh point i think if you are a junior creative it, it, it brings into the the conversation because it's a it's a battle between soft skills and hard skills yeah so the hard skills being their technical ability you know the can you edit that video can you design that mograph sequence can you design that uh that advertisement or that project but when it comes down to being um you know forward thinking and interacting with your teammates or your superiors and getting the right check uh, the you know the checks that you need to make sure that you can keep growing that's talking about you know the soft skills of just simply good interpersonal communication mm. And uh, that's definitely one of the the big skills that I very much had to learn um, when I was teaching myself the the craft, because um, at the end of the day, you know, as a creative, mm, you know, uh, if you can't communicate well with a client or a teammate, if you can't articulate your ideas, if you can't, uh, you know, speak your mind, you're just opening the doors for problems or miscommunications or misinterpretations of information. So... And I think there is maybe, especially if I'm thinking a bit of correlation, because generally creatives, on average, I'd say are more introverted than yes. than extroverted. And, you know, as introverts, we're generally all quiet. We're very soft-spoken. <laughs> we, we don't some like to... Us. Yeah, some of us. We don't like to pipe up, especially if we've got an unpopular opinion. And especially those, say, going through... Have, who've gone through school... You know, generally, if you've got an unpopular idea or s- you ask the teacher, hey, you know, I'm struggling on this point, you get you know, made fun of and you feel bad about it. Mm. But that's that, I guess you could say, that conditioning from those young years could have the knock-on effect of, well, you don't ask for help in the situation. Then you get to the situation where you hand in work that people are expecting performance out of you. It's crap. And, well, now now there's a real problem. Mm. So either, some, either someone has to bail you out or you're going to have to bail yourself out and pull crazy hours. So would it. you say that that's something that like a lot of people would probably experience, being like a little bit shy once they get into the workplace, being a creative, being a introvert for those who are, that it's just very difficult to... Because maybe l- let's take, you know, Kimon's situation as hypothetical and say the person that he was working with was actually just really shy and didn't know. Uh, I assume the person was just lazy and didn't do their work, but uh, let's say hypothetically they were shy, they didn't know how to communicate that they needed help. Would you say that that's really common? I'd say that I'd say it's more common than it sh- probably should be because... You know, at the end of the day, the only way you grow as a person is by learning from the people around you. If you don't ask for help and you don't say anything about it, how is anybody supposed to help you? Mm. You know, if you're in a toxic work environment and nobody's going to help you, it's just like, uh, you know, m- sort it out. You know, that's why I'm paying you. Well, then, then you're in a toxic situation. But in any sort of, um, you know, p- uh, job opportunity or thing where... Uh, or even just interacting on social media. People like helping. If yeah. you, you know, you feel good l- sharing your two cents. You so want what's, to your ad- what's your advice for those people? I'd say just y- there is an element of getting over yourself and feeling of that embarrassment of, hey, I'm struggling or I don't know what to do here because if it is from, say, uh, past stigma of you feel like you're going to be an idiot, mm. uh, you know, you do have to abandon that uh, because at the end of the day, no, because at the end of the day, people want the project to succeed. 
The only way it's going to succeed is by you doing your job correctly. So what do you as a crea junior creative need to do to make sure your job gets done correctly? Mm. Yeah. If you're struggling, you're struggling. Ask for help. If you don't know how to you know, use this piece of software uh, the most efficiently, learn from someone who does. If you don't say anything and people, ex you know, you p if you don't say anything, people just expect you know it. Mm. That's, that's yeah. really the bottom line. I think there's also a, a difference between like being shy to speak up in a meeting, like if, if you guys are pitching to a client and there's you know, some junior on the team and they have an idea that pops up during the presentation, for them to speak up on that meeting might be super scary. Yeah, yeah, but so there's a time and place to speak. Exactly, but what I did, especially after joining with you in the earlier days when I was still sort of learning these things is I'd often have ideas and I'd wanna talk about them or, or pitch something and I didn't feel like I had the authority or maybe the ability even to speak in those meetings, yeah. I just make a little note and then send you a personal message afterwards, yeah. even just a DM. Yeah. And then say, hey, I had this idea in the meeting. And most of the time you'd say, yeah, that's actually a pretty cool idea. I'll bring it up in the next one or we'll add it to the strategy. Or if not, you'll explain to me in a constructive way why that idea doesn't fit into but the... Track. Eventually you did get to a point where, you know, people ask for your ideas. But the, exactly. yeah, I get your point. So what Kim on is saying is that there's an earning of your belt that is required at the beginning where you rather just keep quiet and you send your ideas quietly through the right channel until the point yeah. where you are experienced enough and you'll notice that that vibe in the room change when people where you you gain your teams and the customers trust and then eventually you can you can uh, speak up so there's a time yeah. to be quiet there and then for you there's a time to speak up where you need help. So that just r requires a little bit of, I would say the right words, courage to say, hey guys, uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm new at this, please can someone just help me out with X, Y, Z. Yeah, and I think even a, a really shy, introverted person has the ability to s like send a WhatsApp and just be like, yeah. hey, I'm struggling with this yeah. to their direct boss or even someone else on the team if maybe they don't want the boss to know yeah. that they're struggling with that particular thing. Yeah, It's very different to like asking in the weekly stand-up meeting for assistance yeah and if if you don't have that courage we're here to reaffirm that you you've got what it takes and that that can be difficult sending a whatsapp message and saying i've i've messed something up or i don't know how something works but you can do it and we recommend you do it because by reaching out for that help you can you know in a couple of years you'll wind up being a pro um so yeah i haven't heard about a story from you was there ever a, sto a situation where you were under so much pressure but needed to be creative i think when it came down to the creative i've for the i've been i guess you could say for the most part very fortunate because um i've been very thankful that i've had some very good mentors in my life that really helped me set up very good processes mm. that really s circumvent these common problems where you might find yourself under a lot of pressures for starters you know being a solopreneur don't think that, oh, you know, oh, this is a five minute thing. I can get it done, no problem, because mm. guaranteed it's not going to take five minutes. It's going to take longer than that. So, giving yourself a little bit of brevity and being realistic with your expectations of time instead of thinking, oh, this is a smaller thing. I can bang this out in no time at all. There's always something that's going to chomp away at your time or some unforeseen thing that you never took into consideration. So if you are, you know, if you are a freelancer, if you are a solopreneur or you're a team lead when pitching on projects, the uh, I guess the important thing is do not underestimate uh, any project, whichever however small it may don't be. Don't underscope. Yeah, don't underscope. Don't think, oh, we, we can bang this out in a week or it shouldn't take any time at all. Or even if the, you know you know for a fact that your skill set allows you, oh, it will only take me a couple of days to handle this. So that'll lead me to my next question, like perfect segue. It just popped up in my mind. Why do we do that? Why do we always say, because when you said that, I thought that's me and Kim on and I in a nutshell. It's always, I can do this in five minutes. Don't stress. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, and, and you can, but then you can do that in five minutes and you can do everything else in five minutes as well. And then you do it in five minutes and you probably don't do it to 100% you know, satisfaction rate, but um, you end up burning out in any case. But why do we do that? Why do we always try to, at least some of us, or why do we have the tendency always to try and say, uh, w whether it's at the beginning of a sale, trying to make a sale, or whether it's mid-project, or 
wherever you are with the life cycle of a, a, a client, why do we always try to say, I can do this in like minimal time? What's your guys' thoughts? I have one or two opinions. I but can tell you my point of view. Sure. It's, I think it's just, I have that track history of being a bit of a people pleaser. Yeah. We don't like to get, I don't like to get on bad terms with anyone. I want to ideally have good relationship with anybody, whether it be just simple friendship, interpersonal, mm. or and especially with client relations, especially if this client is, you know, they've been generally very pleasant to you. They haven't been a pain in the butt. They yeah. been generally cordial in all your interactions you don't want to let them down you don't want to be coming across as that guy that that's just being uh, dragging his heels and especially because you do know well as you say maybe you're not at a hundred percent but you can do things quickly you just you you say it without thinking it because well you are very good at what you do so you said you don't want to let them down but isn't it and i know i'm throwing a span in the works here isn't that when you say yes you let them down in any case you just let them down in a different way you're, you're swapping one problem for another. So you say, yes, I can do it. You do it in five minutes. And then the next day they say, well, this isn't really good enough. And you, you know, say, but go back to them and say, well, you were the one that wanted me to do it within five minutes. So uh, there's a, a tweet. I won't look it up now. It says something about like saying no. Saying no is the doorway to freedom or something like that, where you, you say no and you just set up that boundary and enable yourself to be able to give the best of yourself for, you know, the greater, the greater good or whatever project yeah, you and this isn't even create. Just no is an incredibly powerful word. Yeah, power. Uh, it keeps the, I guess you could say, the power of the conversation in whoever says no. So when yeah. it comes down to sales negotiation. You know, often we find l l we're just talking. You know, say sales in the, you know, pitching on a project. You s you don't ever need to feel that you don't have a choice. You cannot say no. You can always say no yeah. to something. You, by establishing those boundaries, like just as a very simple one, I'm only accessible between this, this and this hours. If I'm outside those hours, I, for lack of a better term, don't exist. Mm. And you have the power to say that. Mm. And you know this kind of leads to that conversation of boundaries and setting up those boundaries. But it all starts with no, I'm yeah. not going to do that. And, and you have to be very creative in the way that you explain that no to them. You almost have to sell that no by highlighting the fact that they are the ones that actually benefit because of your saying no, because that allows you a little bit more freedom, a little bit more time, a little bit more creativity uh, to be able to, to do something. But this now reminds me of your point earlier where you said there's, there's, like a, there's a balance when there's too much freedom, when there's too much creativity, you, you end up doing nothing. Yeah. What's why, why did you say that? Yeah, I, especially like you mentioned right at the beginning, how it can be tricky to to manage your own time when you're a creative. Yeah. Because I think creatives that have control over their own time often will procrastinate and not be the best time managers because of the nature of creative people. So yeah. if a project like let's say an edit would take me six hours that roughly translates to in between other admin and things like that i'd say maybe three days mm -hmm. i can comfortably commit to two hours a day of editing on a particular project but the chances of me like asking for two weeks for that and then editing it in the three days before it's due are much higher than me you know editing it in the first three days and then coming back to it a couple of days later looking at it maybe revising a few things allowing myself time to digest and, mm. and put out the best piece of work possible mm. so i think like experience is really important because once you know how to do a particular project and you know how long it's going to take you in a realistic way and you ask for that exact amount of time that's when you'll be working optimally can you, you ask for too much time or too little time it's like you said it's a balance can you turn creativity on or is creativity something that comes to you? I'm not I'm asking yeah. generally, like that's a general question. Can you turn creativity on or is it something that has to come to you? Yeah, there, there's a famous writer, I don't know who it could be, but someone in the, the leagues of like Mark Twain and, and so on, who mm -hmm. has a, a quote from an interview where someone asked him that exact question. They say, do you, do you write when you feel inspired or do you write every single day? So he answered, no, I only write when I'm inspired. And they were like, oh, really? That's so interesting. And then he was like, yeah, luckily I feel inspired every morning. When I <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I think, like the best answer. I think you, you and definitely... And for you personally? For me personally, I think I definitely have off days where it's harder to get into things. Sure. But, you know, 
I'm I'm a big believer in in the concepts of deep work and and flow state and so on. So I feel like if you have the right environment and you you cultivate a sort of pre-ritual to working yeah and then dive in and just commit to like the first 15 30 minutes of like crap where your brain's all foggy and you're struggling through things just fight through that yeah then it, it automatically will open no matter what state of mind you're yeah. in. yeah jeremy know? for me i would say creativity is like a muscle um and or i'd also uh, echo that opinion you know d the difference between say art and design you know Artists a lot, you know, we're trying to, f uh, they try to find the muse or, you know, this spiritual, invisible, you know, tr pathway that's enlightened and they create their best work. You know, especially with, you know, commercial projects, you don't have that time. Mm. So the bottom line is the more you do a, a certain thing, the more media you consume, the more, and whether that be visual media, whether it be music, literature, just saturating your brain with ideas and situations that you can pull from design uh, is a remix you know there's that famous book by uh, steel uh, um, steel like an artist all design is a remix mm. stop trying to be that leads to the whole stop trying to be original trying to think of s something that's never been done for because guess what chances are it has been thought about it has been done before yeah but if i take a little bit of inspiration from this guy a little bit of inspiration from that guy and a little bit of inspiration from several other sources and throw them together congratulations yeah you've got yourself a fairly unique but effective product that you didn't need to rack your brain for a million years trying to find this m mystical yeah. muse. Yeah. If I can just add a little note on on that, I, I also find it quite interesting how it's actually, at least in my experience, really, really difficult to copy someone's art exactly. And a, a good anecdote for that is when I first started learning how to produce music, mm -hmm. I would often like basically mirror tracks is what you would call it so you'd get a song that you really like and try and make that same song yeah yeah like copy it backwards yeah and like specifically spending like several hours trying to copy a song exactly like trying to make the exact same song it still comes out sounding completely different mm. and that's quite a useful technique for people like maybe producers that have beat block or something like that is just throw in a beat that you really like start copying that beat for like the first half an hour then delete it and carry on yeah and you'll find that at the end you come out with a, a beat that sounds completely unique even mm. though you try to copy something else well so because you're you're there's and that's the, that brings me to what what our, my opinion was on can you turn creativity on i would say yes um because that whatever that source of creativity in you just somehow gets turned on and will start to override whatever's going on. I'm sure if you spent enough time, eventually you'd get quite close to something, but let's say in production or something like that, you might be held back by uh, plugins and VSTs that another person has, or uh, uh, you can't quite hit the note that they had on a specific thing, which you can probably get pretty close. But what eventually happens as you're trying to copy them, it veers off because your inner source of creativity takes over. And that's yeah. why I would say you can turn, uh, well, not you can. I, I've noticed in myself that I've been able to turn creativity on just because that that core is there and that, that's just who you are. But I agree with what you say that you have to kind of push through that wall, that initial wall at the beginning. Sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes you say, I need to do this. And I've been so surprised how many times I've been able to wake up early in the morning, hating my life, super tired, sit down, open the computer, sip on a coffee, and then just actually get it done and after three hours of working through this thing that I really didn't want to do I'm able to just get into a creative zone but I've learned and again you're right with having experience that over my years of experience of going through that initial creative block it just opens up it fades away where you start and as you're going you just oh, this doesn't make sense this doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden you're there three hours later and you're like Phew, just in the zone yeah. so I would really say eventually once you've had enough years of experience of doing this uh, behind you, you can trust in yourself and say, hey, you don't want to abuse that. But life is, uh, you know, un, what's it? Un, uh, unexpected events come all the time. It's, life is un unpredictable. So you want to be able to be creative and strong enough in your uh, abilities to say, okay, 
it's a last minute, it's a late night, I have to to get this done. Because, and that brings us back to like the junior versus like senior and experienced person. Those are the kind of people that you want on your team that can, you know, when, you know, the mango, what, what's it? Someone said it in a nice way the other day. The pineapple hits the fan instead of another word. I thought it was a really, really good use of that uh, phrase. But when the pineapple hits the fan, that you can call on specific people. You're not going to ask the junior guy who does that. And that's the kind of people you need because so many times the last minute thing, the late night thing is the one that's going to be your brick break or the one that's going to make you the big money. So I would want to build myself to become a person that is able to take on the difficult tasks at the last minute in the middle of the night because that makes me powerful. Yeah, That, you know, exactly. a, a, a someone, the, the best javelin thrower in the world or the best marathon runner in the world doesn't need three months to say, well, of course they train for three months, but if you want him to run, he'll run now and he'll still be probably the fastest in the world. He might not break his previous record. And a javelin thrower, if that's even the right term, can do it instantly because that's what training is. It makes you good to the point that you're naturally always in a state where you're able to do that. So yeah, creativity under pressure, I say, yeah, go for it and a little bit of pressure is good, but way too much freedom just makes you, you, you know, when you have too much choice, then you don't know what to choose. I, I have like a, a question for you guys, like a thought that I had earlier talking about junior guys. So w you mentioned something the other day about hiring people that have natural talent. Now that that's like a whole debate as to whether talent is something that you form over time through sure, experience yeah, or yeah. if you're born with it. But w what do you guys think is the the thing that allows a creative person to have like an eye for when things look good. So that's something that I would say all three of us have where even though Jeremy's not a video editor, he can look at an edit and say, mm. that seems out of place, it seems off. And it, you almost have like the sixth sense of when you look at a layout or something like that of a, a piece of graphic design, you, you can tell that it doesn't look good and you can move things around until it feels right mm -hmm. and locks into place. So what's the question? So the question is like, where does that come from? Is that something that develops through experience? So if a junior person comes in and basically, if I go back to that example that mm. I said of that guy that was on my team that completely messed up that work, he thought that the work that he was handing in was acceptable. For real? Like just said like, oh, this is really good. Yeah, so like, is that something that you can untrain your, like how, how could he not have seen that what he did was so terrible? I've, I have two opinions on that. I think you probably end up working together with people who have similar taste with you without you knowing. So we might show a body of work that all three of us worked on and all three of us have a good opinion on to someone else and they go, mm, nah, I don't like the look. So that's one thing. Although I don't believe, I, I think that happens maybe 20% of the time. I th I, my immediate response was going to be your upbringing. I think it was, for me, it's maybe just, and I, I would say it's the same with Jeremy because I, I do know a little bit about his upbringing. Um, with you, I don't know that much, but I would say that there were things in your childhood that you observed your parents do or a school teacher do that gave you an appreciation for a certain s synchronicity of style or a certain aesthetic or a certain uh, symmetry. I think it has a lot to do with light, symmetry, spacing, etc. And some someone might take an element, a design element, three squares, and someone might have like a just a tiny little like line in between them, a, a tiny line of space, and then someone might distance them further. Mm -hmm. And you'd show those two images to us, and we'll all agree on which one looks the best. And you show it to someone else, and they go, no, this. And I think that has to do with your upbringing, probably things you saw in I school. I would say I probably have a different train of thought in that. Um, I think when it comes down to like how does one – you know, know what is good design or what is good video or good anything. You know, you don't need to be a videographer to or a filmmaker to know if a movie was good or crappy. You don't need to be, uh, you know, a graphic designer to say, well, this poster looks like crap. Or uh, you don't need to be a great musician to know, to, to enjoy music. Mm. I mean, sure, if you are those, you can appreciate at a level that you you know, that others cannot because you know exactly how hard or what challenges that person might have had to undergo to do it. Um, I can speak from my experience from learning design, you know. It's, as going from the previous conversation, it's 
the part of it is reverse engineering, saturating your mind with what is good design or what is seen as good design. Those, because all good designs have good fundamental principles, you know, your formal elements of your design, good uh, hierarchy, good repetition, good, uh, you know, all the, the layouts and the composition of these designs, they all work. So being able to take, uh, which is one of the best exercises a junior designer or junior creative can do, is take work that is technically brilliant and dissect it piece by piece and understand why is it like this. Same thing with paintings, uh, you know, going through high school art classes and stuff, looking at the quote unquote masterpieces and understanding why are they even regarded as masterpieces. I mean, there are mil you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of paintings that are created all mm -hmm. the time. How do we classify one as fundamentally very good mm -hmm. versus a, a, another? And it's having, just being able to technically take a, it apart. And when it come, came down to, to me, it's exa that's exactly what I did. Sure, we all may have a predisposition to aesthetics and what we find cool and uh, aesthetically pleasing. You know, I'm a big fan of minimalism and clean lines and geometric shapes. And there are other creatives that are, you know, can go full loosey-goosey with street art and curves and do I, I will never be able to design as well as them in that mm. kind of way so i think in from your point you know there's definitely those predispositions from say upbringing or just the personality yeah. of the creative but as to how one grows technically excellent at their craft the, the the fastest and most effective thing is simply reverse engineering looking what's been done brilliantly before understanding why it is very good at a in at an individual piece yeah. Just let's just say let, let's just say a poster, the typography as yep. a start. Yeah. Why is the typography good? And then you like come on to you you co try copy it. Try copy that piece of design, frame by frame or perfectly as it, and do that a few times, and then you start freestyling a bit so and you grow from there. So you're saying, and you just made me think of something that there are universal laws, that. Uh, dictate good design. So I, I, good design or good aesthetic or good look or whatever whatever it is. What I think it is now, now that I've heard you speaking is why an artist why an artist knows something looks good at least in their eyes and in the eyes of generally many others mm. is their understanding of how to affect human emotion because that's all it is. Maybe maybe there's something there. I don't know. I can. I'd like to research that a little bit. But your understanding, what what principles affect human emotion in what way? So, you know, a musician might use high notes because he knows high notes make you feel emotional and melancholic. For, melancholic, yeah, my, for minor example. Minor keys, minor chords. Exactly. Or with, uh, with, with color theory, knowing what certain colors evoke certain... Well, we all things. respond to certain things in certain ways. Or at least most of us. You always have your outliers. Mm. Um, you know, you walk outside and you look at the sun. No matter who you are, there, there, there probably are some people who don't respond in the same way, but no matter who you are, you respond... Uh, What's the what's the, physiologically, if that's the right term, yeah. you respond positively to that sight and feeling of light and warmth, right? And I think an artist understands in their mind, and perhaps you could say heart, how their visual or audio or audio or whatever creation affects people naturally. It almost feels like just an extension of their arm. I do this, I feel that way. I do that, I feel this way. And they know how to manipulate, um, manipulate have is a bad common connotation. They know how to oh. use, yeah, they know how to use uh, that medium um, to be able to affect a person in a specific kind of way. So you look at it, you feel bad. And your gut just tells you. So uh, that's my opinion, based on what I was hearing yeah, you say. I'd say that's a very good segue to, uh, you know, like another point we wanted to talk about was just, you know, branding. Because all of that, you know, f making a deliberate how creatives 
or good designers know how to evoke certain emotions or make people think a certain way. I mean, that's exactly what design as a craft is and why we set ourselves different from, say, what's the difference between an artist and a designer? Yes. Artists, w- you know, you can create a painting and, oh, what's the meaning of the painting? It doesn't necessarily have to have a meaning. It's art. Mm. It's, it exists for the sake of existing. Where but in our world, branding is very important because uh, what's it? Design without meaning is just art but we're not in the business of making art and just having it have no purpose. We need it to have a purpose. So I think maybe we can go into that in the next episode of why is branding so important? Why is it so important to build real, organic, tangible, emotional connections with your people? And then we can go into storytelling, how storytelling does that. So maybe if you guys are keen, we cut it there. And uh, yeah, you'll see us next week or tomorrow or next month or in two years' time from now. <laughs> Um, about that topic. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Sweet. Great conversation, guys. Uh, like, subscribe, and everything down below. If you think that we are valuable and our thought processes are valuable, give us a shout. Uh, visit our website. The links are all down below. Subscribe to us. Give us a call. We'd love to talk about branding, marketing, video, and anything else we're passionate about. Yeah. Cool. Peace. Scene.